one British church leader, while giving a farewell speech to a party of missionaries departing London for northern Nigeria in the early 1890s, said to them, quote, Beloved brethren, you will need patience. Yes, and you will need patience. And above everything, you will need patience. End quote. During the 19th century, the area now known as Northern Nigeria formed a significant portion of the landmass then known as the Sudan, a stretch of land that cuts across Africa south of the Sahara Desert and north of the equatorial forests. It got this name, which means Land of the Blacks in Arabic, from Arab travelers. Northern Nigeria was properly situated in the central Sudan and consisted of famed kingdoms such as the Kanem Bornu Empire, the ancient Hausa kingdoms like Kano, Katsina, Gobir, Daura, Zaria, Rano, Zamfara, and others, the Nupe Kingdom, the Tiv Kingdom, and scores of other peoples and kingdoms including the Kambari, the Jukun, the Umbula, the Igala, the Biram, the Bari, the Kaba, the Igbira, the Bagye, the Sura, the Kibaku, the Tangale, the Bura, the Jarawa, the Angas, the Chamba, the Ham, and the Mumuye, and of course many, many more. Northern Nigeria was then one of the most obscure territories on earth, physically and culturally. Arab travelers were the only ones who had mastered its contours in the course of hundreds of years of trade, which was mostly trafficking in black slaves from south of the Sahara for sale in the slave markets of North Africa. The territory dared the resolve of outsiders. It defied the courage of the bravest among men, and it punished the presumptions of the arrogant. Until the latter part of the 19th century, its mysteriousness romanticized European explorers, many of whom died trying to unravel its secrets. Some of the most famous among the explorers have their graves in northern Nigeria or just close by. Scottish surgeon and explorer Mungo Park drowned in the rapids of Busa in 1806 on his second expedition. German explorer Friedrich Honeyman was likely the first European to reach Bornu and Katsina. He is reported to have died in a Nupe town around 1801. Scottish physician Walter Odney a member of the 1822 to 1825 Bornu mission, died in 1824 in Katagum in present-day Bauchi. Scottish explorer Hugh Clapperton, who traveled widely in northern Nigeria in two expeditions between 1823 and 1827, died in Sokoto. Richard Lander, the first European to successfully trace the point at which the river Niger empties into the sea, was mortally wounded on his way up the Niger in 1832. German explorer and geologist Adolf Overweg, the first European to circumnavigate and map Lake Chad, died in 1852 in Maiduguri. German explorer Edward Vogel, who traveled in northern Nigeria between 1854 and 1856 and was the first known European to cross the Muri Mountains in present-day Taraba, was killed in Wadai in present-day Chad in 1856. German explorer Moritz von Bowman was killed in 1863 near Wadai during an expedition to Bornu to find out what had happened to Edward Vogel. The discoveries of these European explorers, told through their letters and published journals, 
about a region that had hitherto been shrouded in mystery, enthralled the European public and fired the imagination of Christians about the possibilities of penetrating it with the gospel. The peoples of northern Nigeria were animists in ancient times until the Usman and Fodo led jihad of the early 19th century overthrew the traditional Hausa rulers and system and established Islam as the state religion. Islam first flourished mainly in the royal courts and among the elite, the majority of the people remaining untouched by the new religion even though they were forced to live under its influence. With time, Islam spread, but much of northern Nigeria, especially what is known as the Middle or Central Belt, remained pagan. The Middle Belt comprised scores of tribes which had little or no contact with Islam. Where they had been contact, they had rejected the religion or only a tiny minority accepted. But as the 19th century progressed, with slave raiding wars specifically targeted at them and having to constantly grapple with the options of forced conversion or annihilation, the pressure kept mounting on these tribes. From the mid to the late 19th century onwards, many evangelicals in Europe and North America became burdened above the Sudan fearing that the pagan tribes would eventually succumb to the jihadists if not presented with a choice. One mission writer observed anxiously that winning these pagan tribes had to, in military language, become the objective of global missionary strategy. That is, the clearly defined, decisive and attainable goal toward which every oppression is directed. It was into this territory, still largely unknown to the outside world, that ambassadors of Christ, risking everything, marched valiantly. It began as a trickle, but then gradually, in homes, among groups of friends, in churches and missionary bodies, the vision of winning the Sudan for Christ seized the men and women until the movement became a mighty flaw. Their individual stories and the larger history of the movement is definitely one of the most audacious in the annals of Christian missionary enterprise. As death, sickness and discouragement decimated their ranks, more volunteers, contrary to every natural instinct, kept pouring into the territory until they successfully redrew its spiritual map. This is the story of a people who could not be stopped. Our times call for the kind of courage that saw these men and women through one of the most daring missions in history. If we can apply their sense of duty and devotion to the mission of God in our own day, then maybe we can also redraw some spiritual maps. There is an episode from the early 18th century that needs to be mentioned. In 1710-1711, on the orders of their superiors in Rome, two Franciscan priests, Carlo Maria di Genova and Severino da Silesia, set out on a mission of inquiry to Bornu. The mission was inspired by stories gleaned from pilgrims on their way to Mecca of the existence of a Christian community in one of the kingdoms near Bornu. But the mission came to an unfortunate end with the deaths of the Genova and the Silesia of disease in Katsina, never having ascertained the truth of this claim. Even though records document several sources saying that this historically elusive community once existed, the episode will probably always remain something of a mystery. One of the earliest attempts to plant the gospel in northern Nigeria in the 19th century was that of British explorer and abolitionist James Richardson, a fervent Christian and leading campaigner 
against the Trans-Saharan slave trade. He made expeditions in the areas now modern day Morocco, Tunisia, and Libya between 1843 and 1846 to gain an understanding of the oppressions and extent of the Trans-Saharan slave traffic and to campaign for its abolition. One of his burning ambitions was to have Christianity planted in the central Sudan with Bornu as the beachhead. One of his letters, dated October 1849, an address to Christian churches in Britain, was entitled Project for the Establishment of a Christian Mission at Bornu. He stated in the letter, quote, I believe there is now an opening via Bornu to attempt the establishment of Christianity in the heart of Africa. End quote. In 1849, he went on a government-sponsored expedition to the Sahara and the Sudan to further his anti-slavery campaign and promote legitimate trade. Richardson departed Tripoli in March 1850 and after traveling for a year, arrived in Unguru in present-day Yobe in March 1851, where he died of fever and fatigue, just a few days' journey from the capital of the Bornu Kingdom. His papers were sent back to England by the scientists who accompanied him and in 1853, his Hausa and Canary translation of Matthew chapter 2 to Matthew chapter 4 verse 5 was published. This was the first ever published Canary translation of the scriptures. In the 1840s and 1850s, German CMS missionaries in Sierra Leone, James Sean and Sigismund Kuehl, pioneered the studies of Hausa and Kanuri with the goal of translating the Bible into those languages. Even though their desire to go to northern Nigeria as missionaries was never fulfilled, their published works prepared the way for later missionary advance into the territory. James Sean was the first European to extensively study Hausa and in 1843 published a vocabulary of the Hausa language which included the first Christian texts in Hausa like the Lord's Prayer and the parable of the prodigal son. Translations of Matthew's and John's Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles came out in 1857. Genesis and Luke's Gospel were published in 1858 and Exodus in 1859. A dictionary of the Hausa language was released in 1876. The Gospel of Mark was released in 1878 and the New Testament in 1880. Isaiah was published in 1881. His final publication in Hausa was released in 1888, a year before his death. His publishing on Hausa spanning about 47 years. Sigismund Kuehl studied the Canary language intensively with the goal of creating resources for the planting of the gospel among the Borno people. He wrote in 1849, quote, The time will, I believe, at length come, when also in such entirely Mahomedan countries as Borno, the banner of the cross will be unfold. But whether the time is still distant or just at hand, I cannot say, end quote. He published two works on the Canary language, both released in 1854. Gustav Nachtigal, son of a Lutheran pastor and one of the foremost German explorers of the African continent, is reputed to have carried Arabic Bibles into the central Sudan during his travels in the region from 1869 to 1875. Even though it doesn't seem he evangelized, he is reported as being upfront about his Christian faith in his interactions with the Muslim rulers. The Church Missionary Society's Niger Mission, led by Samuel Ajayi Crowder, was the first organized attempt at an advance into northern Nigeria. The CMS Niger Mission had its roots in the 1841 Niger Expedition, which was principally championed by Thomas Fowell Buxton one of the leading anti-slavery voices of his day. Boxing's advocacy resulted in the formation 
in June 1839 of the Society for the Extinction of the Slave Trade and for the Civilization of Africa and the publication in 1840 of his revolutionary book, The African Slave Trade and Its Remedy. In June 1840, a meeting of the newly formed society proposed an expedition to the Niger to strike the slave trade at the root, to introduce industry and legitimate commerce in its place, and to spread Christianity among the people. Men from all walks of life rallied to the cause. The British government commissioned three new ships to be built for the expedition. They were named the Albert, Sudan, and Wilberforce. Scientists gave advice, merchants donated money, and the Church Missionary Society seconded James Sean and Samuel Ajayi Crowder for the expedition. Sean and Crowder were instructed to investigate the potential for introducing the gospel among the tribes along the Niger. The widely publicized expedition arrived on the Niger in August 1841. After several weeks of sailing, during which the team visited many villages on the Niger and during which a strip of land was purchased for a model farm, several members of the expedition came down with malaria. Efforts were made to manage the situation while the expedition moved forward. However, two of the ships had to retreat within days of each other, while the third continued on the journey. Finally, as the death toll rose, the expedition had to be abandoned altogether. Out of 162 Europeans, the expedition lost 48. It was a tragedy of historical proportions. After the resulting public outcry and embarrassment, it would take 13 years before another attempt was made at an expedition to the Niger. It was at the instance of McGregor Laird, member of a Scottish shipbuilding family. Laird was convinced of the prospect of establishing a profitable trade with the interior of Africa through the Niger waterway and also of introducing civilization and Christianity. He offered to finance the expedition and only then did the government reluctantly approve naval support for the mission. Laird made an offer to the CMS of free passage for Samuel Ajayi Crowder, which was accepted. The 1854 expedition was led by William Baker, a medical doctor who had worked with the Royal Navy as a surgeon for a number of years. The voyage was successful. First, no European died from malaria because of the effective use of quinine. Second, the expedition went about 400 kilometers further on the Benue than any previous attempt. And third, Crowder was able to undertake sufficient groundwork for the successful launch of a mission three years later. Another expedition in 1857 at the CMS's prompting, sponsored by Laird and the British government and under Baker's leadership, marked the actual beginning of the CMS Niger mission with the establishment of a station at Onitsha. One of Crowder's main objectives on this expedition was to travel overland from Bida to Kano and then on to Sokoto to seek an opening for the gospel among the non-Muslim population. He also planned to travel southward through Ilori for the same purpose. As a result, he took along on the journey a Yoruba Muslim and Arabic teacher named Kasumo who was to help facilitate his interactions with the emirs and religious teachers in northern Nigeria. Like Crowder and thousands of others, Kasumu had been rescued from slavery through the intervention of the British government and evangelical Christians in Britain and given a new start in Sierra Leone. Even though he did not convert to Christianity, he was grateful to the British government and the CMS for their benevolence and was disposed to view Christian missions favorably. Sadly, the expedition's ship, the Dayspring, 
was wrecked at Jeba in October 1857, with virtually all their provisions lost, and the journey had to be discontinued. The team was forced to camp at Jeba for about 12 months until the arrival of a rescue ship from England. Crowder spent these waiting months traveling extensively on Kano, visiting towns and villages along the Niger to prospect for the mission, and also diligently studying the Nupe language. As a result of Crowder's doggedness and tact, in 1858, a station was opened at Igbebe, a town on the east bank of the Niger opposite Lokoja, manned by Nupe-speaking catechists from Sierra Leone who had arrived with the rescue ship. Crowder returned to his base in Lagos at the beginning of 1859 but visited again later that year and from then on made yearly mission trips to the Niger. In 1865, stations were opened at Ida, the chief town of the Igara people, and at Lokoja, which, owing to William Baker's commercial venture, had now become a trading settlement and a melting point for people from far and wide. Besides administering Lokoja as a de facto British consul, Baker devoted himself to the study of Hausa, eventually translating a significant portion of the scriptures into the language. He died on his way to Britain in 1864, after about seven years in and around Lokoja. His Hausa translation of the Book of Psalms was published in 1881. The year 1862 was momentous for the Niger mission. The first baptisms were recorded at Igbebe. Crowder commented about the occasion jubilantly. Quote, this day at the morning service, though with fear and trembling, yet by faith in Christ, I took courage and baptized eight adults and one infant in our mud chapel, in the presence of a congregation of 192 persons. These nine persons are the first fruits of the Niger mission. The few baptized persons represent several tribes of large tracts of countries on the banks of the Niger and Benue. Igara, Ibira, Bari, Eki, Obruno, end quote. Sadly, about three years later, a clash between rival chiefs led to the destruction of Igbebe, along with the mission's premises. Members of the congregation barely escaped with their lives and were subsequently scattered. Also, the Ida station had to be vacated in 1867 due to the hostility of a local ruler who kidnapped Crowder and one of his sons for 10 days and killed the British assistant consul who led an attempt to rescue them. From their local jar base, Crowder and his team made relentless efforts to make inroads into communities in the territory just below the Niger and also to push further north above the Niger, but were unable to overcome the resistance of the emirs who had subdued numerous towns and villages throughout the territory through endless slave raiding campaigns that kept the inhabitants constantly terrified. Although these emirs often resided very far away from these areas, they installed local rulers, maintained bands of marauders, and embedded networks of spies throughout the area. This forbade any significant missionary advance, save the station at Lokoja, and also a far away isolated outpost at Kipo Hill in Ega. But these operated within very strict limitations imposed by the Emir of Bida, who had jurisdiction over the area and who likely permitted the stations because of British commercial interests located nearby, fully aware of Crowder's influence with the British firms. Christianity was then known throughout the territory as the religion of the Anasara, that is, the religion of the Nazareth, and Christians were called Anasaras. Besides its basic meaning as a nomenclature for Christianity, the word Anasara, as used by the Fulani jihadists and their local allies, had connotations 
of resentment. Negative ideas about the Nasaras were being widely and effectively diffused by the jihadists, and many communities were being groomed to regard them as enemies and resist their activities. Thus, many who were interested in knowing more about Christianity were afraid to come forward publicly for fear of being reported as being sympathetic towards their Nasaras. Crowder and his team were trying to establish their work in an unbelievably difficult terrain and had to constantly be on the alert for danger. They were aware that their movements were being watched and one of his men remarked about the Kippo Hill station, quote, Practically, these natives are hostile to us on account of our creed. We need, therefore, to be cautious and circumspect in our movement. End quote. Over several decades, Crowder explored various approaches to soften the resistance of the Muslim rulers to their mission and secure permission to reach their predominantly non-Muslim population. This included presenting himself as a Christian Malam as per the custom of the Malams that itinerated throughout the area. Once at Igbebe, he sat on the floor on a mat in the Galadimas Anti Hall with an Arabic Bible and J.F. Sean's Hausa translations of the Gospels placed in front. With a Nupe interpreter sitting on his right and Kasumo on his left, he proceeded to discuss from the Bible using the Hausa translation with Kasumo reading from the Arabic Bible. Crowder then gave the Arabic Bible to the Galadima as a gift. Elsewhere in his journal, Crowder recorded an encounter with a Nupe king as follows, quote, I introduced myself to him as a Malam sent by the great Malams from the white man's country to see the state of the heathen population and to know the mind of the rulers, whether we might teach the people the religion of the Nasara and at the same time introduce trade among them, end quote. Later, he records gifting a copy of St. John's Gospel in Arabic to another Nupe king and also sending a copy to the Sultan of Sokoto through him. It is difficult to assess the effect of these strategies. While it likely made little or no impression on the rulers, it is possible that it aroused the interest of those they were actually trying to reach. Anyway, having established a foothold despite the difficulties, Crowder and his team kept laboring day and night to secure their position and plot new strategies for advance. Charles Paul labored for about a decade in Lokoja and then later dutifully manned Kipo Hill. Thomas John labored in Lokoja for over a decade. Crowder produced a vocabulary and grammar of the Nupe language. A.G. Kumba produced an Igbira primer. P.J. Williams produced an Igbira primer and translated Matthew's Gospel into Igbira. Henry Johnson could be seen at Lokoja, sometimes preaching to a crowd of people from several tribes, with four different interpreters at his side. Johnson, a Yoruba of Ilori ancestry, an archdeacon of the CMS Upper Niger Mission from 1881 to 1891, was the first person to translate the four Gospels into the Nupe language. He also prepared primers and the catechism in the Nupe and Igbira languages. Johnson had studied in England in the 1860s and in the 1870s spent two years in Palestine studying Arabic. By the 1880s, he was recognized as a Hebrew and Arabic scholar and in 1885, the University of Cambridge awarded him an honorary Master of Arts degree for his linguistic achievement, the first African to be so awarded by the school. Over the course of almost three decades of traversing towns and villages along the Niger, we see Henry Johnson, Samuel Ajayi Crowder, Charles Paul, Thomas John, and several other workers armed with their Arabic Bibles, James Sean's Hausa translations of New Testament books, and primers and translations 
in the Nupe and Igbira languages, engaging in scores of conversations with the natives, with curious Muslim inquirers, with Malas, and with local rulers, discussing and diffusing the message of the Anasara. Even though the soil was hard and a noticeable harvest was not immediately forthcoming, they were committed to the task and persisted in sowing seeds that they hoped will one day germinate throughout northern Nigeria. They had to constantly encourage themselves not to lose heart because of the trying circumstances under which they operated. They often labored for years in obscurity, had to make do with meager salaries, and had to work with inadequate resources in hostile territory. Crowder thus encouraged his team in a speech in 1866. Quote, so must we preach the gospel to a mixed congregation of heathen and Mahomedans. Thus sowing by prayer and faith, we must leave the results to the disposer of all hearts, who can influence them by the inspiration of his Holy Spirit. End quote. He stated in another talk given in 1869 in Lokoja to reassure them that they were not laboring in vain. Quote, Our Divine Master does not estimate our zeal by the amount of what is actually produced by us. He knows well the nature of the soil we have to work upon. But as long as we sow faithfully, He does not make us responsible for the soil on which the seed falls. End quote. These forerunners would all go to their graves without seeing much fruit in the area, but trusting the Lord of the harvest gave their all to establish a beachhead for the kingdom there.